Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, as you heard, it's not my work, but I try to do my best. So uh, please forgive anything that happens in between. But so the good thing with this, actually, I was lucky because I thought, oh, I have to talk so much about like privacy and genome. But then Jean-Pierre today morning took care of the job for me. So uh, I don't think I need to spend too much time about the uh, necessity for privacy preserving considerations when it comes to genomic data. But these two folks that I know uh, 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 chose this particular uh, type of computation and then said, OK, well, there's so much that you can do with genomic data. Let's focus on only a very limited number of uh, type of computation. Particularly, they chose non-medical related computation. <coughs> By medical, I guess they meant things that are not really, really, really related to diagnostics. So they chose. Um, Ancestry test, paternity test, and uh, uh, genomic compatibility test. And uh, so ancestry test, the idea is like okay, two people want to figure out whether they're somehow related or not. Paternity, you know, you might have seen, um, if you especially watch American TV shows, you know, there's like the test that, oh, you're not the father, you know. <laughs> and then uh, the guy jumps up and starts dancing. And, uh, <laughs> And genomic test is like basically, co genomic compatibility is basically Ice and Bob are like, have been dating for a long time. They're ready to take the ne ne next step, but they want to make, since they're very educated, they want to make sure that the ch child or children that they're going to have will not have any disease. So they want to run some uh, con compatibility to figure out that they don't have any disease. Right? So these are the computations that uh, the, the focus of this paper was about, right? Uh, so, now the idea is like as, as I have been talking about, you know, in secure computation, you, you usually divide into two categories, two party, multi pair party, right? Multiple party is easy, you know, is easier, I should say, because you jump it, it, immediately, you dive into secret sharing and start talking about secret sharing, verifiable secret sharing, and you try to do all those things that we, we know a lot. And we had Sharemont uh, earlier on, right? Two party, uh, well, things are slightly different. Here, two party is better because, as I have been saying, Alice and Bob. So it makes sense to focus on two party. The only thing is that to be different, in this paper, they decided to have a server, like just uh, what Ostap was talking about, somewhere there, right? So the server is going to help, right? So it's a server aided two party computation. Uh, now, the assumption here they're making is that at least one of these parties is quite weak. Right? Computation-wise and communication-wise, uh, let's say Alice, she doesn't want to participate too much, you know, and so you, when you're trying to come up with a solution, you have to make sure that, you know, you're not putting too much burden on, on uh, at least one of them, right? And you are trying to leverage the server, the ADA server, uh, as much as you can, right? Uh, well, I, I, I guess I can skip all of these things. I'm pure said it, the SNEEPs, uh, what they are, you know, uh, uh, what the particular type of alphabets that they come from and everything. And uh, STRs are something different. These are usually used for uh, paternity tests, right? So STRs are basically a, a list of tuples. And uh, in, if, I'm, if I'm your child, for each tuple, I should have uh, one of those two is a pair. One of the, those two that you have, I should have it, right? And so because one comes from mother, one comes from father, right? And so, uh, and by the way, I don't know what this DR stands for, something, right? <laughs> um, so uh, ancestry, what you're trying to do, you're trying to compare it to SNEEPs and, uh, and uh, figure out the intersection, right? And if there is bigger than something, then you say, okay, you guys are too close, you are you're related somehow, right? Paternity, uh, as I said, you try to look at the STRs and say, okay, well, there should be intersection for each pair, and if that happens for all pairs, then you know that guy is your father or mother. Right. And uh, compatibility tests, basically, there are different type of comp uh, uh, methods uh, suggested or offered by folks at the uh, gen gen genomic uh, area and field. And it, at the end of it is either you go the approach of SDRs or SNEEPs, right? So you can't talk about privacy preserving computation without bringing up your security model, right? That, that's the first thing that you have to do, right? So these guys said, that, okay, what is our model? 
And when, when you define your model, you have to spend a good time justifying it. Right? So why I chose this model. Uh, somebody here was talking about two different types of adversaries, semi-honest and malicious, right? Stop. Thank you. It's the advantage of going last because someone else talks to everything for you. <laughs> so semi-honest, the idea, as a step set, is basically the adversaries are going to execute the protocol I just said very quickly, right? And they don't deviate. Malicious, they can deviate. They can do everything they want to do. And they can actually, they don't have to provide the inputs that they're supposed to do, right? So that's actually a big deal. So think about it. The inputs could be anything. They can do whatever they want. So they're up to, uh, up to go, right? So they can do tampering with the input. Uh, and, and these guys said that, OK, for our, pre our, pro our computations, we try to justify our choices. In the ancestry test, they decided to choose semi-honest for the uh, Alice and Bob, right? So the idea is that, uh, you know, they are relatives. So they're not enemies to each other. And that's how they justify. They said that, you know, uh, we're going to say that most likely they just want to f figure out whether they're truly relatives or not or have good intentions. Paternity, I, I don't need to talk about much about it. Malicious, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, if you watch the shows, that dance, when they hear that they're not the father, that's, that explains that you know, they want to basically change the result right, in, in their own benefit. Right? And com com genetic compatibility for disease, like you're passing on to your children. Um, uh, also, malicious is a good idea. Think about it, uh, because that type of competition is a competition that can reveal information. So I can pretend to have. Uh, early signs of Alzheimer to figure out that whether you have it or not, right? And if the answer comes out to be yes, then I know that you have it too. So I can fake my input to basically figure out something about your thing, right? So it, in this particular type of application, when you come down and when you boil it down to the genomic computation, it makes sense that actually not only you have to assume that the parties are malicious, but on top of that, you have to assume that uh, they may actually input or they may change their inputs or tamper the inputs, right? So you have to have a, some sort of verification that the inputs are actually proper, you know, or they're, they're not done in any particular bad way. Um, so uh, again, where is the step? He talked about uh, a garbage silk curves, but again, I quickly mention it. When you talk about two-party computation, the first two things or three things that come to your mind is one of them is homomorphic encryption that uh, uh, usually is expensive, is too slow. And then the other thing is garbled, good old garbage cycle from Yahoo's time all the way till now. And there has been a lot of work to improve it and make it more efficient and all of that. So I'm going to very quickly jump over it because he had a very good slide there that you, know, you can represent your function with Boolean gates. And basically, for each wire, you can represent the inputs of the wire with labels. and. Uh, the party, you, someone will generate the horse circuit with all the labels, and someone, th that guy will be called a, a generator, and the other guy will be called evaluator, will basically engage with the a, a, a generator in the computation and says, okay, give me the labels and I will evaluate the function and go down all the way at the end of the circle and figure out the labels for the output, right? And that type of computation, as you heard it earlier on, involves oblivious transfer, right? And you must have heard that that is actually costly protocol. So you want to get rid of it. It relies on public key operations. And uh, the less you do that, the better, right? And OK, so that's oblivious transfer. I think I can skip that, right? So, so let's go to the protocols that these guys offer or to provide these protocols. Number one, ancestry test. So the assumption here is that Alice and Bob are relative, so they're semi-honest. Now, they're using gar garbled circles. Now, if you uh, think about garbled circles, there has been lots of papers, that in garbled circles, the circuit generator has to be, most times, it has to be uh, semi-honest, but the evaluator can be malicious. I mean, you can have both of it be malicious too, but that will be very complicated. But in the general case, the generator can be semi-honest, and then the evaluator can be malicious. So in this case, they assume that, you know what? We can actually assume that this, folk, this, this guy over here, the server, is actually malicious. So Alice Pop, semi-honest, 
server malicious. And I think this is the, uh, this is the protocol that they came up. And the good thing about this protocol that they came up is that this is a garbage SQL evaluation with no oblivious transfer. So it's quite good. But it's very easy in, in concept. So you think about this that one guy, let's think about that Bob is a guy that can spend more time than Alice. Well, one guy will generate the circuit and, send, and sends it to the uh, server. And Alice will only send her own, uh, the labels that correspond to her own input and send all of that uh, uh, to, to server, and server finishes the uh, computation, finishes the gar uh, garbage circuit, and then sends the outputs, and then they, they both happily, in a fair way, figure out the output, right? And no oblivious transfer quite fast, right? But too easy, right? So I'm going quickly to the more interesting one. When Alice and Bob are malicious, so since they're malicious, they can be in charge of generating the circuit. So who's going to generate the circuit? The guy who is semi-honest, which in this case, server, right? So the server is going to generate the circuit, and now what's going to happen is that Bob is going to jump in and says, oh, well, uh, I'm going to be the evaluator, and now you can't avoid the oblivious transfer, so oblivious transfer will come in, and the size of the oblivious transfer protocols that you're going to execute is the size of the Bob's inputs, right? And Alice will just pass her labels to Bob, right? And now Bob is the evaluator. He's going to run the uh, uh, circuit, and then we'll send to, he's going to figure out the labels for the output. He's going to give it to Alice, all those labels. Now Alice has to figure out that, okay, these are actually, truly the labels that correspond to the output, so she needs to some sort of verification method, and what she's going to say is going, she's going to ask the server. She says that, okay, give me something. So then I will be satisfied that these are actually, truly the outputs, right? That is coming from uh, running the circuit. So what the server would do, because server has all the labels, uh, will hash the labels for each wire, output wire, permute them, send them to Alice, and Alice will just have to do a single, a simple exact match of the hash of the labels with, the ha with everything that she got from the server, right? And um, so, that will take care of it. And again, these guys prove uh, with simulations and everything that why this is secure with respect to malicious parties and everything. Now they have actually, they spent a good time um, on something that initially was difficult for me to understand, but uh, to be honest, to give you a confession, but I read that they, so they, they go a step further for the compatibility test, they actually introduce input verifications, right? So input certification, I would say. Right. So now here you have to rely on another party, the party that like is a trusted party, I don't know, like uh, NIH or someone, that uh, can actually issue signatures on the inputs, right, on the bits of the inputs, right? And so these, Alice and Bob, will have the signatures and all they have to do right now with the help of zero knowledge of proof and uh, some sort of uh, uh, yeah, zero knowledge proof and commitments, they can actually show that uh, the, lab the labels that are providing into the circuits are actually truly correspond to the inputs that they hold the signature for it. Signature from a trusted party, right? <laughs> and so then what they did? So they have all of that and uh, then they implemented their things, right? So they implemented for the ancestry test and uh, I think if I remember correctly, they had uh, I5, three, three machines, Red Hat, I5, they just used one core, uh, and um, they had a very fast LAN connection between three of them, right? So communication delay was negligible, right? And for Ancestry, they had two to the 17 and SNP. They didn't just choose that out of nowhere. They looked at the genomic uh, research, and they saw that's like a typical size. And uh, they, anyway, they implemented, and so basically the, this is the result that you can see. Uh, execution column, uh, you know offline, online, you heard about it, offline you can do it separately, locally, online is when parties are in, interacting with each other. And so uh, you, you can see the, uh, the pretty fast, right? And uh, the communication uh, is basically just the size of the labels and the circuits that they're sending to the, uh, to the, to the party. And then they did that for paternity tests, but no, look, paternity test has oblivious transfer. 
but only one party is doing it, right? So that, the, Alice is completely gone now, she's asleep. And uh, Bob's majority, the Bob's majority of computation happens at oblivious transfer, so that's the bottleneck, right? Right there. And communication in kilobytes, so that's good, right? And then they did for generative compatibility, now they brought the uh, signatures and zero knowledge proof of knowledge, and all these times are, I believe, in seconds, uh, and uh, uh, milliseconds, sorry. All these times are milliseconds, and the, uh, all the communication uh, units are kilobytes, right? And so, I'm, oh, zero time, okay. I just say that at the end of their paper, when you read it, they actually implemented all sorts of computation with the metric multiplication, Hamming distance, a bunch of other things. And anyway, their claim is that, okay, we are not the first people who came up with the idea of using server aided computation, but uh, they show in their complexity table that their complexity beats everybody, right? And they have the fastest, right, uh, uh, with that. And uh, yeah, we can go and read their paper and easy questions. <laughs>